I'm tired. I want to go. Are you going to walk me home or what? You have poor social skills. You have a problem. I have a problem? Mm -hmm. You say more inappropriate things than appropriate things. Doc, she's crazy. Oh, what the hell? Imagine being the person behind the idea for this star-packed Academy Award-winning blockbuster. I'm ready. I feel motivated. I don't feel so angry all the time. Your debut manuscript for Silver Linings Playbook is optioned to be a movie before it's even published. And between going to the Oscars and rubbing elbows with celebrities, you learn it's hit the New York Times bestsellers list. You follow that up with seven more successful novels. You're living the dream, right? Matthew Quick says, not exactly. I've always been really open about my struggles with mental health since I published Silver Linings Playbook uh, in 2008. Before that, I was not at all open, and I think that writing of that novel kind of tricked me into um, coming out as somebody with uh, depression and anxiety issues. But one of the things that um, my dark little secret was as I was going literally around the world telling everyone, hey, if you have mental health issues, reach out and get some help, you know, and it's, it's okay to get help. But I wasn't getting help. Like, I, w I was not getting the help that I needed, and it took me a little bit of a, 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 a breakdown, if you will. He realized he was numbing past hurts with alcohol, so he gave it up and then fell into one of the darkest times in his life. Writing was Matthew Quick's therapy, but suddenly he couldn't even do that. I was blocked for years, and when I say I was blocked, I would sit down every single day for eight hours, and I couldn't write a sentence. For eight hours? Yeah, sometimes longer than that. A year would go by, and I'd have 10 pages, and I would show them to my wife, and she would cry because they were so bad. <laughs> like, it was, she's like, what happened to you? Matthew Quick started Jungian psychotherapy to try to find out. Jungian analysis is really uh, a deep dive into the self, and so when you enter in, um, you're trying to understand all of the things that you're not consciously aware of about yourself. And so it's not a quick fix. Uh, you don't go in looking to get rid of symptoms in a couple of days. You go in looking to really understand yourself in a deeply transformative and profound way over years and years and years of analysis. As he worked through analysis, a narrative voice finally returned. Before long, he had the story of Lucas Goodgame, a man going through tremendous trauma following a community tragedy. Matthew Quick discusses the challenging yet enlightening journey he took to write this soul-bearing novel that celebrates the healing power of art, offers an alternate to toxic masculinity, and provides hope in the form of a supportive community. This book is, is about um, male friendship, it's about male struggles, it's about male mental health issues and the community rallying around, and, and that's something that's near and dear to my heart. Matthew Quick, thank you so much for joining us here in St. Louis. Hey, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. We Are the Light is a book that I felt like had such an immense depth of feeling. And, you know, with social media and television, sometimes you watch things and you think, what is this world that we're living in? You can get a real negative sense sometimes. Mm. I ended this book with such a feeling of hope for the goodness of people. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> I you. needed that. Well, thank you for that. This is a great way to start. Yeah. yeah, I needed it too. You know, after my last book, I published it in 2017. I came home and I dropped off social media and I got, I started to work on getting sober and I had some health issues. So I started running um, and my life radically transformed. And I got a lot of praise for that. People were like, good for you. But then, um, you know, when you drink for 25 years and use alcohol to, as medicine to deal with anxiety and depression, a, a lot of stuff comes bubbling up afterwards. And all of the things that you didn't feel for 25 years become really uh, palpable. Um, and then, um, of course, I, I had this horrible writer's block after, after I got sober. And that, that destroyed my ego. And it made me 
I felt so emasculated. I felt just so uh, vulnerable um, that I, I I had to reach out for help. I, it was it was a low point in my life, and and it was a horrible, horrible, horrible experience. But it led me to entering into analysis and finding my analysts, and and that's been a remarkably transformative experience and a wonderful experience. So okay, so you just mentioned several things that we have to talk about <laughs> within the book. It, it's called an epistolary. Is that right? Yeah, when it's yeah. written in the form of letters. Yep. So it's, it's uh, Lucas Goodgame, the main character, mm -hmm. is writing these letters. And um, Lucas has gone through a, a very traumatic event, and his state of mind is he, he's having fantasies and all these things. So he's not a necessarily reliable narrator. He's definitely an unreliable narrator. <laughs> right? Yes, yeah. But at the end, everything is revealed, which is wonderful. What was it like for you to step into his psyche? I mean, the book is emotional to read. So what was that like for you? to write as Lucas? Well, Lucas on page one is a very broken man. Um, but there's something beautiful about his brokenness. And um, in my analysis and the work I do, the Jungian work I do, uh, we talked a lot about wounded healers, um, people that know how to heal because they know the pain of the wound. And so when I stepped into Lucas's mind and inhabited his psyche, I had to feel all of his pain. Um, and, you know, he comes up with this fantastical story at the beginning of the novel because he loses his wife and he starts to see her visiting him every night as an angel. And, you know, as a reader, you think, oh, how can this be? You know, but um, you also see how this beautiful fantasy that he has keeps him from totally falling apart. And as he shares this fam fantasy very timidly with the people in his community, they hold that fantasy for him very gently until he's finally let it, let, ready to let it go. And one of the things that I was exploring throughout the novel was how narrative and story can be medicine, soul medicine. And you know, I think there's a reason why almost everybody likes to go to the movies and stare up at the big screen, or we like to read novels, or we like to hear stories because because they help us understand um, what's going on in, inside of us. But sometimes it's also important for us to construct stories about our lives, and we all do this subconsciously. Um, but when a real tragedy happens, uh, it's really important for people to, to wrap their mind around some type of narrative that gives them something to hold on to. And so as I was writing the character of Lucas, uh, every day I was I was weeping and laughing and there was joy and there was sadness um, and it was a, a real feeling experience. Um, you know, I did not think my way through this novel. I, I felt my way through this novel. And uh, I think that in order to capture Lucas's humanity, I, I had to fall in love with Lucas. I had to love him and to to allow him to exist in all of his his beautiful weirdness and his brokenness, um, but also in his his uh, masculinity, in the way that he he rises up when he's called upon by his community to to take care of other people, particularly Eli in the book, who's this young broken man who comes to him for help. Um, and in his brokenness, Lucas decides that the way he's going to put himself back together is to put his community back together first. And so there's this real selflessness that is dangerous um, because Lucas really needs to be working on himself, but he's choosing to work on everybody else, which in some ways makes him heroic, but it also is is him masochistically denying himself the work that he he needs to do. And that story, that's a story I'm very familiar with personally. So a lot of people do that, I think, yes, don't you? I think so, yeah. So Lucas is 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 in, he's in a theater, a movie theater, when a traumatic thing happens, a shooting yeah. happens, yeah. and unfortunately, this is a traumatic reality that yeah. people are experiencing now. Why did you decide to make that um, a, you know the the tragedy that is transforming all these people in this book? Um, it, it's such a hard topic to talk about. Yeah, and it was it was not something that I necessarily wanted to write about. Really? Um, yeah, I um, my wife and I have always been big moviegoers, and our first date was to the movies when 
I was 19 and she was 17. So we've been going to the movies for a long time. And we would go to, when we lived in Philly, we'd go to the art house theaters. And we used to joke that it was our church. You know, it was this place where we'd go once a week to go into the darkness and stare up at these larger than life images and try to understand something about the human condition. And it was really important for us. Um, it was really kind of, we went religiously. And uh, when the shooting happened in Aurora, Colorado, and it really, it really rocked me in, in a way that I didn't expect it. And I, and I was a teacher, and so you would think that Columbine would be the thing that um, would really rock me, but that was horrible and you know it was an awful thing, but I was able to go into a school afterwards. I never really worried about going to schools, but after the shooting in Aurora, Colorado, I, I would get nervous going to the movie theater. And I would look around for the exits and I would think, who, who is around me? And so it was this kind of fear that this, this safe place that I really used regularly had been violated yeah. and tarnished. And in 2014, I did a, a one book, one town uh, for the town of Amberley, PA. And I didn't know where the event was going to be, but when I showed up, it was in this gorgeous historic movie house. And I, I looked at the, the, the the face and the marquee, and it looked like a cathedral. Like, it's just gorgeous. And if you look at the cover of the book, it's it's actually the theater on the cover. And okay. I remember doing that event and standing where the movie screen would be, but it was just me up there talking to the community. And there was part of me that was engaged and, you know, having this great time with the community who, who loved the book. And there was another part of me that kept saying, you're not safe up here. You know, like, it was this kind of paranoid feeling. And I've always taken my mental health issues, my paranoia, my fears into what I call the creative writing wrestling ring and try to wrestle them down on the page. So I was trying to write this novel since 2014 and I just couldn't get it right. You know, I couldn't figure it out. Um, I had false start after false start. I would put it away, write something else. But then when I uh, entered into analysis, I very quickly bonded with my analysts in this really profound and meaningful way. And I felt like he cared about me and he, he wanted the best for me. And so the dark part of myself said, this isn't real. Like, this is going to be taken away from you. Like, this, this can't possibly last because this is so, it feels so healthy. And I started having fear about my analysts either abandoning me or, or being killed or getting sick. And so then I thought, well, what if I married these two things, these two ideas, these two fears? And so in the novel, um, Lucas comes out of this horrific tragedy. He's declared a hero by his community. He does not think of himself as a hero. He's completely broken. And when he turns to his analyst, his analyst says, I can no longer be your analyst, and basically just ghosts him on page one, which was my two of my biggest fears. Right. <laughs> and right. so I, I tried to work them out on the page and see where they would go. So all those things seem so heavy. <laughs> but as I mentioned, I don't want to give anything away, but at the end, you're left with this feeling of the importance of community, mm. the importance of good-natured people, acceptance, yeah. all of those things. Um, what is it that we can learn from Lucas and this community that, that enveloped him and Eli with love and support and all the things that you want in this world? Well, you know, the book does deal with very heavy topics, but it's it's ultimately a, a story about a community coming together to put to create a, a piece of art that is quite outlandish and at times very very funny. Um, and it, it, there was a review in the Washington Post recently that said you shouldn't feel guilty if you're laughing so much in this novel. And and I think that that crying and laughter are very close; they're close cousins. And so. Um, you know, throughout the book, I was sh shifting back and forth through the laughter and the tears. And, and I think that's where, where, where you're close to the truth, those things happen. But some of the things that um, I wanted people to take away is the importance of story um, and story as medicine in this town. It tries to create these narratives that, that are really healing and really beautiful to bring people together. One of the things that I was thinking a lot about when I was writing the book is the importance of um, depolarized spaces and even sometimes apolitical spaces. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a great quote by Young that I always mess up because I can never remember quotes, so I'll summarize it. But he said that um, where there is the will to power, there can be no love. 
And where there is love, there's no will to power because one is the shadow of the other. And, um, you know, both of those things are really important. Like we need political activism. We need talk about power. We need those conversations. But we also equally need to be talking about love. And so this book is a book that where my, my narrator, Lucas, is very, very interested in talking about love. And he's very, very afraid of talking about power and, and politics because those are the, the things that are in his, his shadow. And there's another character by the name of Sandra Coyle who is the opposite. She, all she wants to talk about is, is activism and politics and she's very afraid of love. And these two characters are very attracted to each other because they, the shadow is in the other one. Yeah. You know? So Lucas is also very good at organizing the community and Sandra also loves her family and is very good at loving. They've just chosen different sides of the battle, but one of the funny things is that they keep trying to convert each other throughout the novel. <laughs> right. They keep trying yeah. to recruit each other. Um, and then the, the final thing is this idea of um, positive masculinity, and particularly men being given a message that uh, they are worthy of love and they are worthy of giving love. Um, and one of the things that happens uh, when Lucas's wife is, is killed, which isn't a spoiler, this is early, he elevates her almost into a goddess. Like he sees her as an angel, but she really becomes this, this symbol of the divine feminine in his life. And one of the things that she keeps saying to him when Eli comes and this young boy is asking Lucas to help him, to mentor him, she keeps saying the boy is the way forward. And that's a, a mantra she keeps saying, the boy is the way forward. And the way that I look at that is she's really giving him permission. She's really giving him permission to to love and be loved, and to have this really intimate relationship with this young man. And he becomes this um, substitute father for him um, in this really beautiful way. And one of the ideas I play with in the novel too is this idea of father hunger. And I think that a lot of men um, go through life uh, either because they didn't have a father or their father didn't get through his own childhood without being damaged, mm -hmm. not feeling a sense of love from older men. And that, I think, is a really big problem in today's society. Because I grew up in the late 70s and the 80s. Um, my, the men in my family were, were war veterans. They had PTSD. Um, my father was raised by a war veteran. And so these were not men that, that hugged me. They were not men that said, I love you. They were not men that, that put their hands on me. And I remember in high school every morning, I would eat breakfast with my grandparents and my grandfather, uh, he was religious, so he would, he would read the Bible and pray. And then he would hold my hand and uh, pray that I would have a good day and for you know, my well-being. And it wasn't so much the prayer, and I appreciated the prayer, but it was actually the, the touching, the holding of my hand that felt really medicinal and at the time almost transgressive. Um, and I remember too, when I was playing basketball with my, my friends in high school and someone hit a good shot and some come over and give you a chest bump or a yeah, hug. Yeah. And I remember just those moments feeling so shocking, you know, um, to be uh, allowed to receive that kind of affirmation or love from one of my, my fellow guy friends. Um, but in my early sobriety, it was a lot of my male friends and my brother that really kind of rallied around me and showed me love in, in all different types of ways, whether it was having lunch once a week or just checking up on me with a phone call or you know, thinking of ways to kind of break me out of my isolation. Um, and I'm very grateful to that and it was for that. And it was, it was profoundly healing for me. Well, I want, I want to shift gears just a, a bit, if you don't mind. Sure, yeah. I'd like to talk a little bit about these um, monthly personal letters that you have on your website. I, I found it interesting because you, in your last one, you, you were talking about the post-publication depression mm. that a lot of fiction writers yep. receive. And, and you even, I mean, after you wrote Silver Linings Playbook, I mean, you're going to the Oscars, you're a New York, New York Times bestselling author, and even then you went through it. Yeah, and I think most young writers have a fantasy about what publishing is. A uh, lot of people think like, yeah. oh, book tours and all well, these famous people, right? Not only that, um, you know, because there is, you know, when I, when I did the Hollywood stint, the first thing I learned is how hard all of that is. And you look at these movie stars, you think, wow, they have, you know, their lives are great. And 
But when I was at the Oscars, when the cameras were on, everybody's smiling and happy. And as soon as those cameras goes off, everybody looks like they're going to fall over. Um, so tired. Yeah, it's they're just, just they're like shaking. Out. It's 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 such a hard life. So there's that. But I also think too that a lot of creative people um, are broken people, and we tend to think, especially when we're young, if we can hit this milestone mm -hmm. or we can uh, whatever it is, whether it's getting on New York Times bestseller list or just publishing a book, that somehow that's going to heal the broken part inside of us, and it doesn't. And then sometimes when that fantasy is punctured, it, it makes it hurt twice as much. Um, you can't get love from the publishing world. You know, you can't, you definitely cannot get love from Hollywood. <laughs> like, that, that is a <laughs> bad idea. Um, you get love from the people in your community and, and the people that are in your life, and you get love from yourself. And so I think that my writing works best when it's an expression of that. And it's not, I don't think of it as a vehicle for getting that. And so I think that's really been the transition, particularly with this book and you know, going into analysis and working on healing those parts within me, then I'm not bringing that need to the world. But that need has generated a lot of art for a lot of people. Most of my writing heroes were very, very broken people and they, they were chasing something. And that can provide you a lot of fuel and a lot of energy. Um, but it's a dangerous game. Yeah. So what's next? I mean, you, you have a book that's written. My editor doesn't even know about it. Oh. So I've, I've been leaking it on my interviews. I'm just so <laughs> joyful. I'm so excited that I have another book. But I finished it last weekend right before I went on book tour. Good and timing. So, yeah. Yeah. And it was one of these things this uh, fall. I was so busy with prep and interview. I had not planned on writing. And then the voice came. And I just I had to follow it. You know, it was... Um, and it was this wonderful experience, and I, you know, I, I hesitate to say this, but I feel it's it's another step forward in this progression of health and positive masculinity, and I really feel as though it's the most true thing I've ever written in my life. So, okay, well, we'll have to. There's there's Not a lot of steps. It. <laughs> there are a lot of steps it has to go through yeah, before we does. get to see yeah, it. Yeah, but yeah. that's really exciting. And how does it feel to just have it, just for you right now? You know, someone asked me the other day, like, what, what do I do to celebrate completing a novel? And that, that's my celebration is when it's just mine. Yeah. And as an introvert, um, I live in, inside of myself, and that's where I, I like to be. And it takes an act of courage and heroism, you know, to, it's kind of necessary for me to be heroic to extrovert things. Yeah. So allowing the manuscript just to live inside of me for a while um, is, is kind of a, a little reward for me um, as an introvert. And then I'll get brave enough finally to share. My wife will read it first, and luckily she's a big fan of my work, so it's a, <laughs> it's a good audience to test it on. Yeah, good. Well, best of luck. Thank you so much. This has been a truly enjoyable conversation. I appreciate it. Yeah, I loved it. Thank you for having me.